everyone. Welcome to this next session of Win Loss Week. Um, today, we will be speaking with Ike Benyon. Ike is the Director of Product Marketing at Cornerstone On Demand. He is a thought leader in the human capital management space, and we're really excited to be speaking with him today. Ike will be speaking to us about simple ways to think through your win loss data. Thanks so much for being here today, Ike. We'll turn the time over to you. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cam. And it's a pleasure to be here with the closed team, as well as you all with Win Loss Week. Um, as Cam mentioned, my name is Ike Benyon. I'm the Director of Product Marketing, Innovation and Strategy at Cornerstones. Part of my responsibilities is to help not only dictate the direction and differentiation we provide as terms of our positioning, but also helping the product team to make sense of what's going on in the market, specifically our competitors as well. And with that, of course, it's easier said than done than taking all that data that is a part of those processes and making it actionable to move your company forward. So let's talk about two big strategies that you can take to help you to make sense and to move things forward. But first, let's start with an anecdote that I think all of us are familiar with. Um, taking your first steps into any setting can be rocky and entering the workforce for me was no exception. It was 2012, the economy wasn't great, so I was eager to find any little tip or trick that I could get to help me to land my first job. A friend was kind enough to refer me to an organization and I polished up myself, my resume, to make sure I was in a position to be really competitive for that role. And my first interview was with a recruiter. And after the recruiting interview was done, my friend messaged me and said, so it went pretty well, except for that weird part where you asked for feedback about how you were doing. And I laugh now, but I was confused in the moment. Blogs told me to get a read of concerns, questions lingering in the mind of the interviewer, but they didn't really tell me the right context that a recruiter isn't really the person to use that tactic on. So yes, it was awkward. In retrospect, I should have valued the sources of information differently than I did when I was planning my interviews. And the friend on the inside should really have been my first high quality source of information about the culture and what the interviewers were really looking for. So in principle, this isn't new to data. It's well known that you should consider the source and the context of the data that you're looking at. But in the world of win loss, sometimes that isn't as clear. So let's take a more real practical example. Uh, and let's for, fast forward through my career to product marketing in an evaluation I did of a win loss portfolio I was managing. And by the way, regrettably, this was not with closed. But first, I, I literally laughed when I finished putting together this slide of the top reasons that we win and the reasons why we lose. And to call it out for you in case if you don't see it, the top two reasons we won, supposedly, were the same top two reasons that we lose in this particular product set. So having worked in a number of companies doing this sort of analysis as a part of my regular responsibilities, this is not the only time that this sort of thing happens, I can tell you. And many have the answers of why without really understanding the data. You know, they have speculation of why price is number one, it's the fatigue on answering a survey, et cetera. But ultimately, likely, you have the ability to further drill down into your data without even needing to go back to the buyer or reconstruct your survey for more detail. So let's talk about how to do that with two big truths that will unpack again to help you to cut through the noise and focus on the data that matters. <clears throat> the first one specific to my previous example is that there is one key thing that you can apply to my specific example. The first is that conflicting data often happens because you're gathering data from all prospects and customers, even though not all prospects or customers are equally valuable. So visually, let's unpack this a little bit with you. So let's imagine this green square represents one unit of value delivered to the customer by your solution. And by the way, when I talk about solution, I intentionally don't use the term product because in our modern day and age, actual products are surrounded by services and support to deliver additional value for your product. Now, these two in combinations I define as a solution, and it's important for how we're discussing this. So when we look at a market, you'd usually see something like this, that if you picked up some definable measure of your attribute of your customers, you start to see a bell curve. Some customers will buy your product for a narrow or fringe use case that was not the original intent. Some customers will have very detailed, intricate use cases that exceed the intended definition of your product or solution. In the middle are customers who are willing to pay for the solution as is and get a lot of value from you. So this piece in the middle, this top of the hump is what we call our target segment. It's the population of users or customers that get the most value from your product. 
Put another way, each customer has a job to be done, as Clayton Christensen would say, and you do the job pretty well for this specific set of customers. So how do we find that? Uh, you can do it by looking at a specific set of metrics like we have shown here to um, if you have customers that have better funnel performance, win rates, higher prices per unit, higher retention rates, CSAT, and more, the bottom line is, is you should see a little bit of a better ROI end-to-end -end for the customer lifecycle. And the reason why we see some of these funny conflicting things coming in often is because the different segments that are adjacent to the target segment, the segment that you should really be focusing on, are saying things that are a little bit different from the rest of the bell curve. So the segment to the left says that the prices are too high. The segment on the right says that they need better or more functionality. In the middle where we win, where we deliver the right functionality, right functionality to the right price and provide surplus to the buyer is the sweet spot, the Goldilocks zone, which is often is how um, some people talk about it. So in your data, very well for this description, some of the data will say that you win and lose for the exact reasons if you do not segment your data for who is most important to you. So one thing to note about this target segment, though, is that some leaders in your organization may say to you, whoa, 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 segments, what are we not going to sell to everyone? And the answer I give personally to leaders who ask this question is you can pursue any deal that comes in the door. That's up to you, head of sales, head of marketing, whatever. But this data evidence approach shows where we probably would get a better return on our cross-functional business investment on product sales, customer service, and marketing. We'll get a little bit more bang from our buck, spend less time trying to retain customers because, again, we're delivering the right value for the right price. So let's take let's distill the takeaways that we should get from this first truth that we talked about. <laughs> One, make sure that you've created a hypothesis and test with your data about who is the most imp important buyer in your market for your value proposition. Then make sure you have the right ways to drill in on that segment to focus on what they're saying. But don't get too narrow because that being said, the adjacent segments could be as important to you if the market shifts or changes. Your target segment could shift over time as competitors or demands or different pressures on your customers evolve or change. Lastly, it may actually help you to find segments with a different deployment of your product pricing or targeting that could yield some nice outcomes for you. But never lose focus of who reliably signs your check. Because when the market tanks or big changes occur to your competitors, these are the customers you're going to have to count on and having a really good, strong relationship with them. So some of you are saying, OK, great, this is not news to me. I've done this before. Even the target segment is asking for very different things, especially in terms of functionality. So let's talk about that. Let's introduce a second important truth. Not all functionalities of your product are equally valuable. Let's do a little bit of strategy and differentiation 101. There are two sources of differentiation. First is functional differentiation, or put another way, your product is something different from the competitors. Then there's brand or position differentiation, or the way you talk about the product or solutions where it's going is different than the competitors. Both contribute to the overall solution differentiation. Again, don't forget to think about all of the value you deliver to the customer. You want credit for all of it, not just strictly the ones and zeros if you're a tech product, for instance. But what's at the arrow at the bottom? It's important to remember that functionality differentiation should in part feed, uh, it should in part feed position differentiation. What the solution does in part should drive how you talk about it. So that's why we're going to focus on what we're going to focus on in the next slide is the functionalities of the product. So to that point, your solution doesn't deliver equal value in all of its parts. So segmenting that out is also pretty helpful too. So Theodore Levitt outlined a handy way to think about this, and I modified it a little bit to today's discussion. Essentially at the heart of this is to bucket differentiation of features according to how they contribute to how your buyer thinks about purchasing. So the darkest green box table stakes is what qualifies you for the product category. It's the very first most basic search a, pro a buyer might do when looking for solutions to their problems. Those italics at the very bottom um, on this previous slide are essentially thinking about it if we were doing some headache relief um, analysis, looking at that product. That's what a buyer would ask themselves for. The second level is the expected product or what is the minimum the buyer expects from the solution. 
The way I think about this specifically is what disqualifies substitute competitors. For headache relief, I could take a nap or I could drink some caffeine as alternatives to taking ibuprofen. But really for this job to be done, I need it to be quick and mess free, so therefore it needs to be in a pill. So that's the minimum I or you expect from headache relief, really, in terms of the product. The third level is differentiation solution, or this is what the features or functionalities actually accomplish for the job to be done for the buyer. What is the thing that makes the buyer say yes to your solution? So to test about to test this and whether or not you've got it on the mark is to ask yourself, if I got rid of this single functionality or small grouping of functionalities, would I lose 80% of my customers because they're no longer receiving the value that's most critical to them? And if the answer is yes, you've likely found your differentiated functionality set. In our example of ibuprofen, it has to be fast acting. I need it to kick in in the next 30 minutes before this upcoming meeting where I'm gonna yell at people if I don't get my headache relief. The fourth level is important because there are some functionalities that extend beyond the differentiated value your customer enjoys, but is not actually the reason why they say yes to your solution. So for instance, in our ibuprofen example, it could be long lasting or liquid gel capsules. But if I had long lasting Advil, but it didn't kick in for four hours, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't buy that product because again, I need quick acting. I need it to kick in in the next 30 minutes. I may not even have a headache in the next four hours. So therefore, fast acting is more important than long lasting, but it's a plus. Long lasting is nice for me that I don't have to take pills all throughout my work day. Now it's important to note, after you do this exercise once, it's important that to, to remember the market is going to change. As competitors get parity on the different competitive feature sets you have, what's expected is going to change. What's differentiated is going to change. So make sure that you're keeping an eye on the adjacent buckets over time because they're going to tell you something about how the market's evolving. Let's talk about bonus points, extra credit that you can do as a result of what I've shown you here. You can actually do this exercise as well with competitors once you especially know the buying behaviors of the buyer. How your feature set is uniquely positioned will of course be compared in the buying cycle to your competitor. So this might make a lot of sense to your evaluation. So you can take one set of features on one axis and another set of features on the other, and you can plot out with a rubric where each of your competitors fall. In this hypothetical chart, our star is the company that we represent. And the circle surrounding it is what I define as the competitive sphere. And the primary competitors that surround us, those three that fall in the competitive sphere, are the ones that I want to make sure that I have two eyes on in the market at all times. And then the different quadrants represent different places, different evolutions of different competitors through the market. And over time, we can also watch as who's coming up on our tail and make sure that we have good visibility into them. So therefore what? Make sure you understand the reason your buyer says yes to your product, not just all the value you deliver because you'll get lost in the data. Make sure you've really manicured how you differentiate around the yes point. So once you've defined what that is, make sure that it's crystal clear to the buying and marketing cycle of why they should say yes to you. But it's also important to understand what's happening in the market around you as well. So specifically coloring competitors, how they approach the buying point, the yes point, to sharpen your own differentiation. As you may be sensing, yes, you can actually cross these two truths together to really put meaningful weight against the win-loss data that you're gathering. So let's take a look at what that looks like. You can cross the perspective of who is the most important to you in the market, and then with what's the most important part of the solution to them. And then you get different zones that help you to focus for different questions that you may need to ask. At the very center is the most important. Are you hitting the target with your buyer of what they need you for? Could you be more precise in how you hit it? That stuff at the center, once you've done this differentiation, will really help you to focus there. The next layer out is how you detect change. So as things shift in the market, that layer surrounding your target is really key to help you to adjust and to watch how the market's changing. Finally, the last is good to know. Leaders will come to you with big news that's contrary to what they anticipated. An account doesn't care about a new release. But you already knew that because you know that the, the, what the core segment is and that particular account isn't in the core segment because you've already done the work to cut through the noise and focus on the data that matters. Thank you.